Welcome to Aurora Public Library's Virtual Living Room, where we are about to enjoy an evening with George Elliott Clark on the subject of his new book, Where Beauty Survived, an Africadian Memoir. My name is Risha Mandelkorn, and I have the pleasure of hosting this evening's event as part of Aurora Public Library's celebration of Black History Month. Before we begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. We are all immigrants and children of immigrants to Canada. We gratefully acknowledge the original caretakers of this land. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And as we share this space, acknowledging the Indigenous nations reminds us of our important connection to this land. Aurora Public Library is located in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee. As settlers and newcomers, we have been invited into this treaty of peace, friendship, and respect. In that spirit, we honor all who came before us, our own ancestors, as well as all the Indigenous caretakers, named and unnamed, recorded and unrecorded. Uh, before we start our evening, I would also like to acknowledge some of the people who I happen to see on the guest list. With us this evening are some of the leaders of the Black community in our local areas, in Aurora, in Newmarket, in Richmond Hill, in Vaughan, and Markham. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for being with us this evening. I also noticed several politicians on the list. Thank you so much. We all need to work together to create harmony in our communities. Welcome everyone. We're going to begin our evening with a few questions followed by a short reading by George from Where Beauty Survived. And then we'll open up the Q&A to what I know will be a lively conversation. Please feel free to submit your questions or comments at any time through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And at the bottom of your screen, you should also see uh, the ability for you to open up closed captions. Uh, so that you'll be able to see what we're saying transcribed for accessibility purposes. And we will be recording this event as part of the library's archive of author visits. George Eliot Clark is an internationally renowned poet, novelist, playwright, screen uh, writer, librettist, and scholar. His books have won many honors, including the Governor General's Literary Award, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Achievement Award, and the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellowship Prize. He was appointed to the Order of Canada in 2008 and served as Canada's seventh parliamentary poet laureate. Welcome, George Elliott Clark. All right, I finally unmuted. Oh, thank you so <laughs> much. That was a great introduction. You know, after well, you know two what? Years... Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say that um, if you were such a nice and generous person, you would really intimidate me. But I am I know I, I'm going to have so much fun this evening with you that I'm so excited to be hosting this event. Well, so I've been to... looking forward to this. So I'm going to start with a few questions of my own before we open up the conversation to our guests. Um, I want to hold up your book, first of all, because it's absolutely wonderful. We have it in the library. We have multiple copies in the library, and I, I do hope people go out and, and read it um, because they're really in for a treat. And uh, I, I think I'd like to start off by just putting us inside your book. You were born just a few miles away from the historical Africadian settlements and grew up in Halifax. Would you please describe the time and place so that we can immerse ourselves in the setting of your memoir. Risha, uh, thank you so much for that question. I just uh, want to say again how delighted I am to be invited by the Aurora Public Library to talk about this book. It's Black History Month. Uh, it certainly is, uh, the book is certainly timely in, in that sense. Uh, but also, um, anytime it is great for talking about uh, the formation of artists and and scholars and activists and people who are interested in trying to make our communities and neighborhoods better in whatever way possible. Um, and I, I'd like to think that that um, 
uh, those transformations or those formations are not necessarily completely accidental, but that there are formative influences. And that's really what my uh, memoir is about. Um, Amanda Betts, my great uh, editor at Knopf Canada, uh, said to me that I should write about the first 20 years of my life. And I thought at first, well, that's not gonna cover very much. But once I got into it, Risha, I realized that that really was the formation of everything that happened afterwards. And it really got me thinking about the roles played by my parents, of course, other relatives, uh, friends and, and mentors, and of course, a certain librarian at the Halifax North End Memorial Library, Miss D. A. Mooney, uh, who really took me under her under her wing. But I really have to start to answer your question. But I just wanted to say again how glad I am that we're having this conversation. So um, I had a very special childhood for one very simple reason. I wasn't born in Halifax. I was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia, which is uh, a rural, uh, in a rural area. It's a town. It's a major town um, in, in Nova Scotia. It always has been. It was always the, the summer retreat of the Haligonian gentry who wanted to escape perhaps what they saw as, as um, uh, unpleasant um, summertime uh, smells or what have you in Halifax, and and so they would take their coaches and their and their horse and buggies and their and eventually the railway, and they go to they go to to uh, uh, Windsor uh, for the for a holiday or for the summer or what have you, um, and it still is a bedroom community for for folks who work in Halifax but want to basically have the the countryside as a place for them to live and and raise their children and relax and so on. Um, and, and so, but to get to the point, why was that so special? Because it was the country. Um, and, 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 uh, and of course, like all the pastures and there's the horses, there are the cows, there's the railway, there's the train going through and all the romance of, of that. And of course, all of the, uh, bounty of, of the orchards and, and of the, the, uh, hazelnut bushes and, and uh, of course, the blackberry and raspberry bushes, and and the crab apple trees, and apple trees, and pear trees, and so on. And and so for me, the country, and in fact, the place where my mother's parents had their home, a place called Newport Station, which is right next door to Three Mile Plains, where I still own land, three quarters of an acre, and I'm very proud of that. Um, you know that the fact I own that land makes me a kind of esquire. And I like to joke, I shouldn't joke about this, but sometimes I do. All I need now are some peasants and that'll be all set. <laughs> but again, it's only a joke and I realize it may not be a very good one. But anyway, um, so I was, I had a sense of bounty and plenty, plenitude. Um, and my, my uh, 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 maternal grandmother, she would, she would really dote on my brothers and I have two brothers. Uh, we're all close in age. I'm the oldest, but we're all very close in age. And and um, she would just dote on us. She would give us everything. And, you know, it was her husband uh, was a little bit gruff, and he might not have wanted her to be so generous with the supply of ice cream and chocolate bars and caramel corn and cracker jacks and uh, and everything, not to mention the molasses and, and bread and sandwiches and, and so on. I actually mentioned the fact in my memoir that I was seven before I consciously knew I was I was tasting butter uh, because um, uh, we we weren't uh, deprived of anything. Uh, but my father uh, tended to be a little bit of a, a very, very economical. So he wasn't going to splurge on butter when we could make do with margarine. And so that's what we had. And so I'll, I'll never forget. I remember it plainly to this day. I'm seven years old. And I, and I asked my grandmother for a sandwich. She makes me a chicken sandwich with, with, with butter and salt and pepper. And I bit into it. And I remember how, wow, what is this? This is so good. And, and, and I, I asked her, I said, Nanny, what is this? She said, it's butter. She, I don't think she realized that we were butter deprived, keeping in mind that many others were deprived of many more things. Uh, so we were very well off uh, in comparison. 
But still, uh, I just say that anecdote, which is in the memoir, to underline what a place of plenitude I felt I had in the country with my grandparents and the smells of wood smoke, for instance, and the smells of, of the forest in, in, in autumn. And, and again, a kind of smoky scent and a sharp scent and, and, and uh, things like going into the woods to cut down Christmas trees with my uncle and, and uh, being told a little bit about how to get along in the woods and, and all that. So it was, it's just very magical. But at the same time that I had access to the country and I felt like I was part of it because I was born in Windsor, even though I, not, I didn't grow up there. I grew up in Halifax. But my brothers and I would go to would go to Three Mile Plains Newport Station quite often, and and uh, but uh, I was also I also felt very blessed to be growing up in the capital city of Atlantic Canada. Uh, it may be a small city by other people's standards, but for us and for me, uh, Halifax was uh, it, it was the biggest entity around in, in terms of in terms of urban living. Of course, and so that meant not too far from my home. I could go uh, to two uh, cinemas and watch all of the uh, features and cartoons and filler documentaries for only 50 cents. Wow, you know, wow. And in those days, um, I, I hope I'm not being overly nostalgic here, but my recollection is that our parents, even though we were in a, we were in a major city, uh, at least for the East Coast, our, our parents generally in our neighborhood did not seem to feel that we were at that much risk to be on our own. So, you know, I'm six or seven years old and I'm, I'm uh, walking my cousins who are, who are age five to school on my own. Now, that's only a 20 minute walk, but still, I was trusted to be able to do that. And we were all trusted to be able to go to the cinema on our own and enjoy the, the features and the, the, the cartoons and whatnot, and, and then get, our, get home on our own. Uh, we were trusted, I think, to have a lot more responsibility and, and just to go out and play. In those days, uh, the idea uh, that, that you had to be really policed in your, in your uh, playground activities just was not there. We, we were just basically thrown out of the house and told to go and play, and, and that was that. Uh, and being in the city, there were lots of opportunities to, for play. Uh, and, and of course, that was everything from uh, street hockey to, of course, hide and go seek uh, and, and jumping over fences and running through other people's backyards, <laughs> trying to escape being chased by the dogs and so on. Hopefully we're all tied up um, and, and uh, uh being rambunctious, but not doing anything uh, um, hooligan-like or delinquent-like or anything like that, but, but making sure we could have a good time uh, as much as possible. And so uh, my childhood was, was magical because I had all of these various uh, pleasures available to me in the country. And then I had uh, equivalent pleasures available to me in the city. And, and, uh, and of course, also in the city, I had the library, uh, the North End Memorial Library, which was built uh, in part to commemorate the victims of the Halifax explosion of 1917, when a uh, uh, French munitions vessel blew up in Halifax Harbor. Uh, it was the biggest man-made explosion before Hiroshima. And now you know I'm from Halifax, because every Haligonian knows this stuff, <laughs> All right? So, uh, yeah. So I had, and of course, you know, there's the cinemas, there's also um, uh, the playgrounds, the, the, the library, once again, the, the art galleries, uh, the museums, uh, there's the, the harbor front, the waterfront, for crying out loud. And, you know, Halifax was also a magical city. I can talk about all the downsides of Halifax, too. You know, there, there were plenty. But part of the good side of it, as I, as I recollect it, as I think about it in the memoir as well, it also has to do with smells, because... We had a chocolate factory at the very heart of downtown Halifax, only a few steps, a, a couple of blocks from the provincial legislature. A chocolate factory right in the middle of, of downtown Halifax. It's like Willy Wonka, right? Like just just plunking down this factory right there. And so you, could, you would always be smelling, you know, the scent of chocolate. 
uh, all times of the year. And it was interesting because, you know, you could have somebody walking by who maybe has some Chanel number no. five on or whatever. And then all of a sudden that Chanel number no. five has some notes of, of dark chocolate or milk chocolate going on. On the other hand, there could also be clashing, really clashing smells like from the, uh, uh, the uh, fisheries um, in the, and uh, which is also the, the, the harbor is right next door as well to the, to the chocolate factory. Uh, further away uh, from downtown, there is a Ben's bread factory. So you have the smell of the bread and so on. And then also there were the breweries, the Olin's, brewery and so on. So us as kids, we always used to, to ride our bikes by or walk by Olin's Brewery and we'd smell the, the beer smell and we'd pretend to get drunk. <laughs> smell of the beer, right? Uh, so so uh, all of those experiences, and I, I almost forgot, I mean, Gottingen Street uh, was the shopping street. Wow. You know, urban so-called urban renewal, which really means urban demolition. That's what, that's what it really means. But with uh, before urban renewal, before they gutted the downtown of Halifax to uh, uh, enable commuters to more easily get to their workplaces and, and then leave without any regard for the people who actually live in Halifax or lived there at the time, uh, uh, Gottingen Street was the major shopping street. And so I'd have to walk down that street with my brothers to go to, go to school. Uh, and and so there was a dress shop, the New York dress shop. There was the French pastry shop. Um, of course, uh, lots of uh, shoe stores and and two two department stores in, in one block, two Metropolitan and Woolworths, right? And so, and so especially at Christmas time when they put the lights up, oh my, it it was like a little glimpse of paradise. You you could, you'd go everywhere. Like starry eyed and open mouth gawking and at, at these unbelievable uh, scenes, especially with a little bit of snow falling. Uh, it's very, very magical. Um, and and uh, but after they put in uh, the major shopping center, as it was then downtown, right downtown Halifax, called Scotia Square, it killed Gottingen Street, and it has not come back. It had it went through a, a period of great decay which actually uh, I experienced in my teen years. I saw uh, Gladys Street just slide downhill completely and all the boarded up businesses and, and, and so many that went under and, and it started to look very dilapidated. We used to have, we used to have three banks, if I remember properly, three banks there, uh, or no, two. Uh, um, uh, yeah, Royal Bank and also uh, uh, Bank of Nova Scotia. No, we had three. It was also Bank of Montreal. Uh, they were very close to each other on Gottingen Street and Canard, which intersects with Gottingen. And and after the the, the the destruction that was visited upon the community with so-called urban renewal, even even the banks left. Uh, and and uh, so you know, there was there was uh, so-called white flight, and then also capital flight. Uh, the hollowing out of what had been uh, a really interesting and somewhat prestigious uh, neighborhood, but I'm getting far away from your from your wonderful question. So um, I hope I've given some sense of of just how special. It's, but there is one more thing I'm going to add, and that has to do with the Black community, uh, which existed uh, uh, both in Three Mile Plains and still does slightly. Three Mile Plains, Newport Station, um, and and then in Halifax, North End Halifax. Uh, that's also vital here uh, for readers to understand that when I was growing up, there were still 43 Black communities. I said communities, communities, little villages for the most part. And, and one of those villages was in fact Africville, which many of our uh, audience tonight may probably have heard of. Uh, which was itself urban renewed, i.e. destroyed, bulldozed um, in the uh, 1960s. But um, when I was a boy growing up, uh, uh, there were black communities everywhere and fairly vibrant, including Africville. 
And there's also Beachville, which is also uh, right next door to Halifax, and also uh, uh, the outer uh, uh, Black communities like North Preston, East Preston, Cherry Brook, Lake Loon, and then also nearer to Halifax would be Hammonds Plains, um, and then many other communities around the mainland, and, and then a few uh, Caribbean connected, West Indian connected communities in Cape Breton, uh, Sydney, Glace Bay. Uh, to be really precise. So what that meant for me as a boy is that going up home, as we would say, going up home to Windsor or, or Three Mile Plains, Newport Station, meant that you were going from the Black community in North End Halifax to an, another Black community, except it was a rural Black community. If you were there for church, you'd go to the uh, Three Mile Plains, no, sorry, Windsor Plains African Baptist Church. Yes, African Baptist Church. <laughs> And, and you'd go there and you'd be the organ and the pianist and blah, 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 and the choir and all these voices. And in fact, when I listened to those voices as a boy like singing, it was frightening because they were like, there's like this thunderous uh, uh, sound coming out of all these adults. It, it was, it was uh, uh, mind boggling. I couldn't understand how they, how they could sound like that. It was, it's, the volume was, it was incredible. Um, and then the same thing in Halifax. We just lived a couple blocks away from the oldest uh, Black church in Nova Scotia, which is uh, now is called a New Horizons Baptist Church, but originally it was Cornwallis Street African Baptist Church. Um, and and uh, and so we go there uh, as well. In fact, we had to go every Sunday. Sunday school, we had to go to church. There's no way, there was no avoiding it. We wanted to avoid it, but you couldn't avoid it. <laughs> Because we'd have to go for Sunday school, which I think was at, at 10 a.m. And then our parents would show up at 11 a.m. So we had to be there. There's no escape. We had to get the stories. We had to listen and let it sink in and so on. Holy smokes. Um, and then we had to go sit in the service. And you had to be careful not to squirm or fall asleep or anything. Uh, because then you'd have to get a hand upside your head. And, and think, yeah, and they, or they just lean over and whisper and you knew that you were in trouble. So you better straighten up and pay attention and, and try to sing. <laughs> try to sing. So uh, that was also special. Uh, the fact that, that I, although I wasn't really conscious of it as a boy, I was not. Uh, the fact that, that um, um, it, was, it was a rural Black community that was mainly Black. Um, uh, there were white people living there as well. And, and then a lot of us are also mixed with Indigenous people. Uh, for my on my part, uh, uh, demonstrably, provably Cherokee, possibly uh, Micmac. I don't insist on that because I cannot prove it. But the Cherokee has been proven, and and um, and uh, and that's because the Cherokee were aligned with the British when my mother's uh, ancestors uh, arrived in Nova Scotia in 1813. Uh, Cherokee were also, because they were aligned with the British, they also uh, ended up, some of them, in Nova Scotia. And the communities intermixed and intermingled, and sometimes even intermarried. Sometimes. Sometimes it was just intermingling without bothering with the marriage. But anyway, uh, so that's another thing, too, that was very, I, looked at, I talk about it in the, in the memoir. I mean, one reason why it was not possible for me to adopt a hardcore Afrocentric black nationalist position, even when I wanted to as a teenager, as a way of identifying myself as being black and pushing back against the white racism uh, to which I and my brethren and sister um, uh, were, were uh, oppressed by. And, and uh, uh, the reason why I could not easily take that kind of a position because I had relatives who were, who were white who were indigenous or who were part white, part indigenous, part black. Uh, some were probably completely black, but then I had others who were completely white and I had others who were a mixture. So uh, my childhood, in my childhood, the faces around me were a spectrum. They were bronze, they were indigo, they were mahogany, they were caramel, they were copper. Uh, they were ivory. They were they were uh, marini, British, um, sometimes, um, and as as well as just straightforward black. And so I inhabited a rainbow of complexions 
as a as a boy, and so that made it far made it impossible for me to think, well, you know, I can only be with black people, and and uh, uh, and have an identity that is only focused on on my African ancestry, because the fact is, I'm mixed. It's like um, a lot of other Africanians, as I call African Nova Scotians, especially those who've been around for a few hundred years. And and uh, uh, and then, of course, uh, in my own uh, family, immediate family, my mom was a very proud, very feisty, uh, no doubt about it, Black woman. Uh, but she was very light complected. She looked white, uh, but she was totally, totally devoted to black culture. Uh, she was also, of course, as I just mentioned, I'm, I've got some Cherokee. So she definitely, because it was on her side of the family uh, and and uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, some uh, Micmac as, as well, possibly. Um, but uh, despite the fact that, that she was a mixed race woman, my mom's uh, soul, to use a 1960s term, as in soul music, my mom's soul was like just utterly <laughs> undiluted black. And she didn't want anything else. Like that, that was that. That's where she was absolutely centered. Um, my father, on the other hand, even though he was uh, clearly a black man, no problem. Uh, his father was was uh, Jamaican. His mother was was black uh, and from uh, with uh, roots in Virginia. Um, uh, although she, of course, was born in Nova Scotia, uh, so he's clearly black, not a problem. But my father's culture was European. European. You know, it's like you got to speak the Queen's English. You're not going to be any of that jive talk or slang talk or or gutter English or bad language in my house. Absolutely not. You are going to enunciate. You are going to pronounce each word uh, properly. Uh, you're going to have good manners. You're going to be courteous and law abiding. And you will understand that you are subjects of her majesty. And, and uh, there was this uh, regalness about him. And, and again, a, a devotion to classical music. Uh, it was one of the great things I keep talking about how, how rich my childhood was. And one of the ways that it was so rich was uh, on my mom's side, there was nothing but Motown. And, and of course, James Brown. She loved James Brown for crying out loud. Uh, and, and Peaches and Herb and, and uh, Lou Rawls and, and the Sound of Philadelphia, Barry White, when, when all that was happening, disco's thing was happening in the 70s. Uh, and she loved all of that, right? And so, but my father, it was like, no, we're going to listen to some Beethoven. No, we're going to put the Bach on. No, we're going to put the Brahms on. And and Rachmaninoff and, and so on and so forth, right? And so Sundays, you know, it's really strange. I, I mentioned this in, in, in the memoir. Despite the fact that, that we were a church-going family <laughs> and so on, right? Uh, despite that fact, uh, neither of my parents played any church music. Not one, not one bit of church music ever got played at home. But after church, if my, if my father was was in, it was classical music, maybe some Broadway show tunes, maybe some movie soundtracks like the Pink Panther, for instance, uh, Porgy and Bess, of course, um, and so on and so forth. And then if if he had to go out and do something, then my mother could grab the stereo and throw on the black music. So we were, it was always like this mishmash of, of sounds. Uh, and, and my father was also uh, an artist monke. He was actually a very good uh, painter, visual artist. Um, and and uh, so he would often spend Sundays as well uh, 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 just painting uh, scenes of one sort or another. And so I grew up with, with his art around the house, I see him making art. Uh, and then of course, um, 
uh, he would pick up reproductions of the European masters. So there's Rembrandt over there and, and so on, hanging off the wall. There's there's uh, Monet over there hanging off the wall, just for, just for the hell of it. You have a Picasso, or he like throw together a collage, a, a massive collage and take up the whole living room, one side living room wall with, with his piece of art. And, and um, you know, I didn't have any real critical faculty to, to determine, you know, what was good or what wasn't good. But I thought as a child, and I still think now, that he was a, uh, he was a phenomenal artist. And I think that that gave me uh, an inkling that it was possible uh, to potentially have a life in the arts and to have access to all that music. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, we were always going to movies and, and, and uh, uh, watching specials on television, Ed Sullivan and all that variety shows laughing for those uh, listening or watching who may remember that uh, variety show from the later 1960s. Um, and both my parents made sure that my brothers and I knew about world events, uh, serious things that were happening. So I don't really have any memory of it, but I know that my parents made us, because I would have only been four years old, they made us sit down and, and watch the Beatles when they first appeared on the Ed Sullivan show. I do remember watching the Beatles on a, in a later appearance on Ed Sullivan as an older child. Uh, I also remember, uh, this is actually one of my earliest memories, uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination. I was only three, three and a half. Um, but um, uh, I remember that incident that day uh, because of the fact that we had to take a nap. Uh, being three and two and one, <laughs> we had to have a nap. So, okay, I'm taking my nap. Uh, but I was awakened because a, a woman, a neighbor woman who actually babysat us sometimes, came running up the road from where we lived, when we first lived in Halifax, or when we lived when I was uh, conscious enough of, of, uh, of it. It was the Bay Road, St. Margaret's Bay Road. And this woman was running up the road and she was screaming, probably something like Kennedy's been shot or the president's dead. Of course, I was too young to really register any of that. But here was an adult who was out of control and overcome with emotion. I had never really seen that as a three and a half year old. Um, and and uh, so that's why I remembered it. But there's another part of that of that day that's important. And that is that my father uh, driving to his workplace um, uh, uh, took me with him in his pickup truck and I was, so I was sitting of course sitting in the front and and the CBC was probably on he he lived and died by CBC radio uh, yeah he just loved it rolled at six I was like he's right there you know every night at home supper time rolled at six Bob Oxley <laughs> no choice of it okay what's going on in the world today um, and we'd be listening to that while we we're having our supper and and but anyway to get to the point of this anecdote he uh, explained death to me as a three and a half year old as we were listening to all this somber music classical of course and and the somber conversations um and it probably has something to do with with autumn leaves because that would have been all around it was of course november 22nd 63 so there were still some there were still some leaves, and that's probably how he did it. Now I, I can't say for sure, but I do remember that that um, um, he explained it to me and why everybody was so upset, and and uh, uh, so that was a, um, a riveting uh, memory. So, so, I, so George, uh, sorry, I was going to say as you've been speaking. Um, and, and saying that, and, and you wrote that race didn't play a large role in your consciousness growing up because, you know, your father was quite dark, your mother was quite white, your relatives, everybody in between. Can you tell us about when you first became aware of, of and I'll say this in quotations, race? Well, that's a great question, once again, Risha. And um, I guess there, there are two answers, and I'll try to get through them quickly. The first time is I'm four years old and uh, my brothers and I are playing in front of our house on St. Margaret's Bay Road, 117 St. Margaret's Bay Road, I still remember. And, and um, 
some boys were coming up, it was, it was probably May, it was springtime. And some boys were, uh, there were three of us playing in front of our home in the front yard. Uh, and then there were three boys, white, a little bit older. They, you know, we were, we would have been four and, uh, and three and two. And they were probably like, more like seven, six and five or where they were all five or all six years old. But anyway, so they are older. They're coming from school. They have their, they have their book bags, as we used to call them. And they're, and they're coming up the, the hill, a slight rise in the, in the road towards us. And as they approach us, they start uh, picking up um, stones and throwing them at us and calling us the N-word. Well, I'm four. I've never heard it before. I have no idea what it what it means or what it implies. So, and of course, I'm the oldest. So I start picking up rocks and throw the and silly, but look at it. maybe I, even though I was only four years old, I'd seen a whole lot of Bugs Bunny cartoons, and I knew and Roadrunner and all that. I knew that when somebody throws something at you, you got to throw it back. This is what they do in the, in the Saturday morning cartoons. So that's what I was working off of. I thought, oh, they're throwing stuff at us. We just throw stuff back. They call us names. We call them names. <laughs> it's like very simple logic for a four-year-old. Um, but I hope that my calling them the N-word may have given them some thoughts. Like, what's going on here? No, you're the N-word, not us. No, you are, not us. Anyway, uh, my father was home. He worked nights. And so he was home and, and uh, probably napping. And, and I know this may sound shocking to contemporary audiences, but believe it or not, parents were just a slightly more trusting, I guess, of others or their neighbors or, or just of their own children that we, he could afford to take a nap while we were playing in front, of the, in front of the house, understanding that we were unlikely to be kidnapped and we were unlikely to run into the road and get hit by a vehicle but anyway to get to the point uh he woke up he came out and and uh he understood what was going on right away and he he shooed the uh three white boys away and then he called us inside the house and i knew from his tone of voice and the serious look on his face that i was in trouble because i was the oldest and i was the one who was who was firing the, the pebbles back or or whatever and so I was really worried because I, I understood my father was a very stern disciplinarian. And, and I also don't mind saying that he was also abusive, right? Physically abusive uh, towards us and my mom. And that part of my childhood was very, very uh, sad and, and embittering uh, and, and difficult. But for the most part, I emphasize the positive because for the most part, it was positive. But to get to the point, he called us inside the house. I'll never forget this either. He sat us down, uh, three of us together on probably his sofa, Chesterfield, uh, the couch, and, and then um, brought out the mirror and put the mirror on a chair in front of us. And then he brought out a, a bowl of white sugar and a bowl of brown sugar. And he looked at us and he said, you guys look in the mirror. Yes, daddy, we look. He says, oh, you're brown like the brown sugar. I said, yep, that's right, yep. And he said, and those boys who were, who were bothering you, they're white like the white sugar. And we said, yeah, right, okay, yeah, clear as day. And he said, very simply, some white sugar people don't like brown sugar people. But you must never use that word that they used with you. End of lesson. And of course, it has stayed with me. Uh, like profoundly in my heart, in my gut, in my head ever since. Right. And, you know, so as I say, that was the, my first encounter with a racial consciousness. Right. Like to be given, to be imbued with a racial consciousness at age four, uh, that was it. But our lives were more or less integrated. My classmates were, were of all complexions and, and mainly white. Uh, and because I tended to be one of those 
uh, gold star pupils who liked being a teacher's pet and liked getting a little gold star and liked, and liked getting the, the good report cards to take home and so on. I can show, proudly show my father, hey, I got another set of all 90s or 100s or A's and whatnot. And, and uh, he'd reward me with a quarter, which of course was a fortune uh, in those days. And, and, uh, and I would feel like really good and I would be motivated to keep on getting those straight A report cards as much as possible. Um, and, and so because I tended to do very well in school and I was liked by my teachers and I liked my teachers uh, very much, uh, I, didn't I didn't have a whole lot of, of issues. Uh, I don't remember uh, being called the N-word uh, in my uh, elementary school classes, uh, which were mixed. Um, and and uh, uh, I know other black kids uh, certainly felt that they were dealing with discrimination, racism. Well, discrimination, prejudice is what we would say back then. Prejudice. Oh, so and so was prejudiced, and and uh, so they would they would explain that, and I would and I would think, well, how is that possible? Because I'm doing okay, uh, and so on. And of course, I'm too young to understand streaming. I'm too young to understand how how whole cohorts of black and brown and immigrant uh, pupils, uh, indigenous pupils, uh, uh, would be deliberately be be placed in in lower um, echelon classes uh, in terms of intellectual or educational attainment, and that started because uh, there were always there were always two or three versions of each grade. So you'd have like grade two would like maybe there'd be two or three versions of it. There'd be a version that would that I would be in that would be like basically the advanced grade two. And then there would be like a, a more middling grade two. And then there'd be the slow grade two, all right? And that's how they did it. And so and so you'd end up in one of those divisions or not. Uh, and so a lot of my uh, uh, black uh, classmates, schoolmates, I should say, friends and neighborhood chums would be in one of the other slower grades where they probably would have experienced more outright blunt blatant prejudice or racism uh, we, as we might as we would call it now than i would experience being in a more advanced grade two just to even think about the idea of being in an advanced grade two it was like basically it was 2a i remember now it was like 2a 2b and 2c that's how they did it, it was letters so I would be in 2A or 3A or 4A or what have you, right? And, and uh, uh, so again, I, I didn't really, I knew I, I knew I was colored, which is what we were called and what we call ourselves often. Um, and, and uh, but I didn't feel oppressed by that uh, because I wasn't being, as far as I knew, I was not being oppressed by that. Uh, the only times when I would realize that that uh, something was amiss is when, without my mom or without my dad, I would go with my chums into a store, into a, a department store. And then it didn't matter that they knew my parents because I was going in the store with, with my classmates, schoolmates, my friends, my chums. Uh, the managers would, would literally chase us out of the store. Would chase us out, would make us, would, would, you know, just boot us out of the store, I guess, because they thought we would we would try to steal something or we were going to like shoplift or something like that. And so then I would realize, oh, you know, like this is this is I'm being classified as I'm being stereo. I wouldn't have used the word stereotype, but I would have to understand that I'm being classed with everybody here as as a potential troublemaker, as opposed to being an A1 student. Right. Um, and which was important to my self-concept. And, and uh, uh, another thing that was connected to both class and race as a child, and I write about this in the memoir too, and that is that, um, I, as I was just saying, and I'm not bragging about this, but it was so much great, it was so much fun to be always the first in class, to, you know, to, to dominate grade three. Wow, to dominate grade two, fantastic, right? and. And so at the end of the year, the daughters of the of the empire, 
the DOE, the Daughters of the Empire, the Daughters of the British Empire, would present um, all the high-scoring uh, pupils with a book um, and, and a little certificate to say congratulations uh, for grading and, and being such a good pupil and so on. And the school I attended then, uh, Alexandra School, no longer exists. It's been replaced by a condo. A condo and townhouses, ladies and gentlemen, it's happening everywhere. But and that's not to say I'm I'm totally in favor of all housing, all housing for everybody. Um, although I am sort of um, you know uh, referencing gentrification here when I make that comment. Uh, so that neighborhood, which used to be totally working class, uh, is is now being gentrified, and that's really what I'm sort of critiquing here. Um, but anyway, to get to the point, uh, that school would have, it was a full service school, it was a baby boomer school. So it, it had all grades from primary to grade nine, right? And of course, I'd see the grade nines, the 15 year olds, like they were like, they were gods. They were so tall. They had so many books. Holy smokes, you know, you're looking up to people in grade nine. Wow, I, I, almost high school. Um, and and uh but we would have a convocation we'd have a graduation ceremony grading ceremony should call it graduation grading ceremony uh for all the grades and and uh my mom would come with me she was at home with us at, in those mid 60s years and and uh so she'd come with me and i'd be sitting there with the other high scorers the high achievers uh, in grade two three four and five um and and uh uh and we'd be waiting to get our, our gift book from the daughters of the British Empire. And and uh, uh, and the school invited, this is the point of, the, of my memory. Instead of the principal or the vice principal or maybe a teacher, maybe even the gym teacher, uh, giving us all a pep talk and saying, you know, you did well, you did good, congratulations, you know, keep at it. Um, instead, the school invited a peace officer, a constable, one of Halifax's finest. And for at least two years in a row, he was our featured speaker at our little grade school grading ceremony. And so there we are all prim and proper, you know, nicely bow tied and whatnot, clip on bow tie, of course. And, and the hair, you know, buzzed and parted and and there's my mom you know very proud sitting beside me and so on and the other moms usually and 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 their uh, children who are also being celebrated and this beat cop gets up in front of i don't know maybe 100 people or so in the gymnasium and addresses us from the the pulpit the podium the lectern uh may as well have been a pulpit because he was definitely preaching and what he preached to us was this. This is going to sound bizarre, but I assure you it happened, and it happened at least two years in a row. Here's a beat cop with his holster, his gun in his holster. And he's addressing all of us essentially working class and immigrant and welfare recipient uh, uh, children, uh, black and brown and, and, and so on, and our parents, our moms. He's addressing us. This white beat cop with his gun in his holster is addressing us. And what does he tell us? He tells us school is worthless. School is pointless. You shouldn't be worrying about reading and doing well in school. You have to do well at sports. The world is one where you have to be able to fight and defend yourself. You should be wearing boxing gloves, not carrying books. Now, I hope that this sounds awfully perverse to everyone. I hope it does. I really hope that this sounds extremely perverse to you, that in a school where we're supposed to be celebrating the fact that we have actually graded when many others, or at least a significant number of others did not grade and are going to have to repeat grade two and repeat grade three and so on, that we grade it. And we not only grade it, but we did well. 90%, 100%, 85%, A's. B pluses, whatever, gold stars. And this agent of the municipality of Halifax has the unmitigated gall to tell a bunch of, of grade schoolers 
that school doesn't matter, that reading doesn't matter, that books don't matter, that we should all be getting into the gym and, and working out and making sure that we are buffed and toned and, and muscular and able to defend ourselves in, in the boxing ring or just on the street in what, a knife fight? Uh, maybe, maybe that's what we should have. Well, really, if you follow the logic of that of that beat cop, why why would we bother boxing? We should just go all of us and pick up uh, knives, or maybe if we're lucky, we can get ourselves a pistol. If the whole thing is that we're going to be we're living in some kind of Darwinian uh, uh, jungle universe uh, where it's the survival of the fittest, <laughs> you know, if books aren't don't matter. And boxing gloves do, then well, maybe uh, firearms matter even more than boxing gloves. So uh, the perversity of that a moment says to me that the city of Halifax and the Halifax School Board uh, believed that we, uh, the working class, underclass pupils, uh, had no future and didn't really deserve to have any future, no matter how well we did in school, except to be somebody's servant, uh, somebody's soldier, somebody's sailor, um, or join the, join the ranks of the low-waged, unskilled, often unemployed, uh, lumpen proletariat. Let me use a Marxist term. Why not? You know, every now and then, everybody's got to cut loose with a Marxist term. You know, there's some of that analysis is okay. Um, and, and that was how they treated us. So, oh, you grade it? Great. We're going to have a beat cop come and tell you that is all unimportant. I see that as being racist and classist. Um, and that that's how we were, that's how we all were treated, um, as despicable. Uh, we were treated despicably as discardable. Uh, so, so George, I want to, I want to pick up on that because, um, you're talking about that in the past, but but in your memoir you wrote, and I found this so hugely powerful. And this is this is a, a, a real. Your conversation leads me into this piece. You write, given that black pupils notably have been subjected to streaming, whereby teachers and school administrators push them into less challenging courses, which will, when completed, only grant them skills for entry level work for generations. One has to recognize that the suppression of their intelligence is an evil act of government sanctioned sabotage of their life opportunities. So I ask you, we're talking about your memoir, but now we're in 2022. How do we get to the place where we need to be? Wow. <laughs> um, well, we would have to have. Uh, I know this is a dangerous word, and I absolutely am not a romantic about this. I'm going to use the R word, revolution, which does not necessarily mean, you know, overturning uh, streetcars or setting something on fire. No, I don't. I don't mean that at all. I do mean that we need to have a revolution in thought and morality, uh, uh, and this really means at the highest levels of the society. We have to stop thinking that any group of people are automatically expendable or discardable because that is how our society has been structured. Now, the whole residential schools um, uh, situation, the discovery, the horrific discovery of unmarked graves, uh, the fact that the genocide word, that horrific word, can now be applied to Canadian government policies uh, and and uh, the churches, uh, which were uh, not only Catholic but you, but United Anglican, who carried out uh, those government-sanctioned policies, which were which were meant to obliterate Indigenous cultures, Indigenous languages, and and uh, and 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 basically do away because the idea I think they had the idea was that if we can get rid of Indigenous Indigeneity, then we don't have to worry about potential land claims. We don't have to worry about potential liability for this and liability for that, because uh, Indigenous people will be assimilated out of any, any notion of indigeneity and into the Canadian mainstream. Uh, but so long as, as, as Indigenous people were still, for the most part, reserved to reserves, uh, not to play on words, but but it has that effect. Um, 
uh, it would have meant still futures of economic uh, uh, stagnation or uh, 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 impoverished uh, forms of, of, uh, of, of life uh, in one of the world's richest nations, uh, as opposed to uh, making it possible for indigenous peoples to be indigenous and not have that count against their economic opportunities. I'm still taking a long time to say something very simple, which is which is this. We have a society, we have a society that is a hierarchically organized society. I'm not the first person to say this. The the person who owns this real estate was uh, was John Porter, who published one of the most important books about Canadian society, The Vertical Mosaic. The title says it all. In John Porter's analysis published in 1965, he argues that Canada is a racially, ethnically structured hierarchy um, with a white Anglo-Saxon Protestants at the top and everybody else in descending order from Francophone Catholic second, but everyone else in descending order down to the bottom. And at the bottom, it's indigenous and black. That's how he saw Canadian society functioning in 1965. And I would argue, and the stats are there to prove it, that it still looks pretty much like that today. Which means that the structures of the society, which is why I talked about revolution, need to change in order so that we move from thinking that Indigenous people are expendable, Black people are expendable, it's okay to warehouse us in prisons, it's okay to deport us, to exile us, or simply to immure us uh, in intractable poverty that then, gets, that then gets passed down generation to generation because there is no way to acquire enough literacy to be able to, to lift ourselves and our families into the middle class. And this is all well known, which is why I say that it's actually evil and diabolical that governments have structured our society in this way. It took me a long time to understand it, but I think I understand it. And it goes like this. I'm going to put it in very simple terms. I have to put it in very simple terms. So it's going to sound, maybe it'll sound strange to some of our audience. We are a monarchy. I know, I know you're going to say, but it doesn't matter. It's only symbolic. Yeah, okay. It, it, we are symbolically a monarchy. But guess what? symbols matter and the fact that we are a monarchy means it by definition that we are a, we are a hierarchically organized society now we say that we believe in equality but we actually practice uh recognition of levels of status and i want everyone in our audience to to hear that word for a moment i want you to to think about where do you hear that word, status? Status is, to me, the secret word for understanding Canadian society. Because our society is set up on the basis of your status. Status of women, status of Indigenous people, um, uh, non-status Indian, status Indian, uh, landed immigrant status. What is your immigrant status? So the word status is the bureaucratic Canadian term for determining where you belong in the pecking order, where you fit in the hierarchy. Our whole society has been structured this way since 1867, since Confederation. Uh, intriguingly, uh, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms makes war on that. It makes uh, The Charter of Rights and Freedoms actually declares war on the British North America Act. They are two very different parts of the Constitution. The British North America Act sets up a hierarchical understanding of Canada. So for instance, uh, in the Division of Power section for the federal government, which I think is section 90, yeah, it's section 90, Division of Powers for the federal government, uh, responsibility for, for, this is a direct quotation, responsibility for Indians and lands reserved for the Indians, that's the exact quotation, is number 24, out of a list of 27 powers given to the federal government in 1867. In other words, um, indigenous people and, and, and indigenous reserves come after lighthouses in the official list of powers given to the federal government in 1867. 
come after lighthouses, come after tax collection, come after uh, uh, the post office. Uh, uh, they come after even weights and measures, figuring out correct weights and measures. Like when you go in the supermarket and you're going to use the scale, everything's supposed to be double checked by the federal government, right? And also when you're pumping expensive gas these days, you'll see a little sticker on the on the gas pump, which says that it's been checked certified by essentially the government of Canada, because they have been given that power under the 1867 constitution. Uh, so that constitution was definitely about hierarchy and where different people belonged in the, in the Canadian state um, and so on. So Pierre Trudeau and, and uh, the framers of the charter uh, in 1982, uh, when it was ratified, uh, understood what they were up against because uh, in order for uh, minorities to have any degree of equality true, truly in the constitution, then multiculturalism had to be recognized uh, in the charter. Also, of course, indigenous people, Métis, Inuit, are given official recognition in section 35 of the charter. Uh, gender equality is enshrined in the, in the charter. Uh, also, uh, affirmative action programs are protected in the charter. Uh, and and uh, that was all done deliberately to offset the prejudices of the British North America Act. Um, and anybody who disbelieves it, just check it out. You can Google it easy, easily. It's there. The Constitution is yours. Take it all and look at it. And it spells out exactly how the country was structured and what the fathers of Confederation thought it should be, what they thought it should be. And it was definitely a white man's country, preferably English speaking, preferably, preferably Christian, and preferably Anglican on top of it. <laughs> We're getting some really good uh, questions coming into the Q&A, so I'm going to sort of go off script because I, I really want you to answer them because they're, they're excellent questions. Um, this one over here, I, I would like to go with first because it's uh, it, um, sort of in, as a response to something you said very recently. How were you able to rise above the horrendous attitude of that cop to succeed? And what advice would you give young people facing those racist attitudes? That's a, such an important question. I, I don't want to take a chance of not asking it. Oh, no, thank you, Risha. It, it is a great question. And I'll just go put myself back in my four, uh, seven-year-old, eight-year-old self. And I can tell you, I was devastated. I'm sitting there feeling good. My mom's beside me. I've got my my gold stars and, and so on and waiting to get my my precious book gift. And and I just felt like sinking into the floor because I knew I was no boxer. I was no fighter. You know, if I ever got into the, the boxing ring, I'd be on I'd be under the ring <laughs> in a second. Right. So I really felt uh, totally dis 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 and, uh, disempowered. Absolutely. I felt like I was a fraud. I shouldn't be here getting getting this award. I, I have failed. I thought I succeeded by passing, but obviously I failed. I should be out playing hooky and going to the gym. Why am I, you know, failing to fulfill what society expects of me? So how I got over that was basically the fact that, uh, and this is a very important, both my parents validated school. They saw it as being very important. And again, my father uh, was a very difficult uh, person. He was a very moody person. Some might even be tempted to say bipolar. I won't go there. I think he had real reasons for, that doesn't make his behavior acceptable, but I think he had real frustrations in his work that he took out on us unfairly. But that's what I think happened. But anyway, apart from that, and I do have to, you know, segregate those 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 uh, behaviors. Uh, he was very he was very serious about my doing well in school, and it was one of the few ways that he would show me his love, uh, or what I took to be his love and 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 respect, was when he gave me that precious quarter because I brought home an excellent report card, uh, and my mom when I was when I was eight took me down to the recently opened. Uh, Halifax North End Memorial uh, Library uh, and D.A. Mooney, 
uh, who you know was uh, uh, the librarian uh, at the time. And she was, uh, Miss A. Mooney was so uh, sweet. And uh, I hope you don't mind my using the term schoolmarmish because that's the term that comes to mind. I don't mean any, I absolutely mean no disrespect by using that term, but she had a kind of schoolmarmish, school mummy kind of, of sensibility about herself. And it made you feel really comfortable and she acted like she cared about all of us, often poor kids, uh, welfare family kids, immigrant kids coming into the library. And sometimes some of them would be pretty rambunctious because they had nowhere else to go and they would and they go and they act up and, and so on. But she would do her best to calm everyone uh, and and get us to read and treat us to magic like magic shows. They put on magic shows so I mean, you see a dude pulling uh, needles out of his, out of his mouth. I mean, come on, I mean, supposedly out of his belly. You know, you know, and the puppet shows and so So, and the movies, you know. So it was, it was like an all-purpose institution at the Halifax North Branch. But to get to the point, um, so I, Miss A. Mooney was, was the uh, librarian, head librarian. And my mom takes me down there to get my first library card. And again, I was trusted. I was eight, but still. She trusted me to, to go three blocks down to the library, load up with an armful of books, and then, and then walk home, and then read them, and then go back and get another arm load, come back. I was doing that all the time. So my nickname as a, as a kid was Professor. No, Professor. It's the Professor, because I was always had all the books and so on. And, and uh, by the time I was 10, I had, I had basically gone through the children's section. I hoovered up everything in the children's section, da, 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 da. And so, you know, I was now eyeing the adult section, which basically uh, you could only have access to if you were 15. But Miss A. Mooney took pity on me. And she knew that she could always check my, the, the titles I was borrowing anyway. So she gave me access as a 10 year old she let me go on the adult side and and you know just and start reading the the mysteries and the and the thrillers the alfred hitchcock presents type of, of books uh, along with uh, uh, uh some science books and novels and so on uh and i felt very validated i'm 10 but i can go on the adult side nobody else can and i can get all these you know like higher level books to to go through and of course it's building my vocabulary at the same time and when she was checking out the books she had a chance to make sure i wasn't taking out anything that was um too uh, steamy or uh too far above what she would consider to be an appropriate <clears throat> level text for someone of, of my youth uh, but um uh, one book did slip through and and it and it offered me the mysterious word pudenda um it took me a while to find a dictionary that actually included it but i eventually did and then it was like oh i really possess secret knowledge now wow right so um so that's how i overcame those kinds of actual attitudes uh, and I know I've got to leave time for more questions, but let me say this. I'm, I'm going to try and say this as quickly as I can. Many oppressed communities deliberately repress themselves uh, any possibility of an intelligentsia arriving. I know it's another fancy Marxist word, but you've got to use it. They, they, they actually prevent it because they're afraid that if their youth pick up too many of the white man's books and speak the white man's English, the Queen's English, that they will somehow then be brainwashed and removed from the struggle that their peers face and that their parents face and their relatives face as racialized, marginalized people. And so the success actually try to repress uh, their children from doing well in school in order to try to prevent them from being brainwashed out of their culture, brainwashed away from their own heritage, their own roots. But what is often lost by that approach is the possibility of having leaders from within the community, grassroots people from within the community who also have the school book smarts 
as well as the educated uh, lived experience smarts to be able to go up against the system effectively as lawyers, as teachers, as doctors, as artists, as writers, as spokespersons, as poets, um, and without, without feeling that they're going to be cowed by the supposed uh, greater brilliance uh, of, of the opposition, so to speak. So one of the most important things that any oppressed community can do is generate an intelligentsia. That's what you want. You want an intelligentsia. You want a whole bunch of very smart people in order to go up against the system and force it to change because they cannot bamboozle you. They cannot lie to you because you know how the thing operates. You've seen all the studies. You know what's at stake. And they cannot uh, set you back. They cannot bamboozle you. They cannot buy you off because you know your history. You know the politics. You know the economic setup, structure. So, so far from running away from school, uh, uh, black parents, indigenous parents have to take over the schools. You got to flood the schools and make sure the parents, if they can, they got to make sure they are there hammering on the door all the time, the principal's door, vice principal's door, going to parent teachers meetings and making sure that that school is going to produce in their child an intellectual, an intellectual whose words will be like laser beams and, and swords cutting through all the blarney and all the other stuff and to get to the point and, and get things happening. And if one of them becomes a lawyer, they all become lawyers, so much the better. They want to become neurosurgeons, rocket scientists, so great, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I have to tell you, I, I've got goosebumps right now. It's uh, going to be a little hard for me to read. Um, I think that's the most fabulous answer I've ever heard. So I just had to calm myself down a little bit and, and, and move on to, uh, to ask another question. Thank you so very much for, for, that, uh, for that piece, George. Um, question came here. The last racially segregated school in Canada closed in Guysboro County, Nova Scotia, 1983, approximately 39 years ago. How did that change come about? Well, I think uh, keeping in mind that 1983 is, uh, is uh, practically, uh, uh, well, certainly uh, 20 years uh, past uh, uh, the heyday of the civil rights movement in the United States. So it's a relatively kind of late development. But uh, how that would have come about would have been pressure from the Black Educators Association, which was formed in 1978, uh, the Black United Front of Nova Scotia, which was formed in 1969, um, uh, the Guysboro community uh, activists, uh, Black community activists who would have uh, fought for those changes, uh, understanding that, that um, in a place of high unemployment and relative illiteracy and relative poverty for everybody, not just black, but white too. Because when I talked about the, the hierarchical organization of Canadian society, that also impacts um, uh, white Canadians, especially those who are working class. And that's particularly true for the East Coast where many people work in primary extraction industries, the fisheries, mining, forestry, uh, as well as of course, agriculture and farming. And, and so their livelihoods are precarious. Uh, we're, we've been hearing recently about the problems with uh, potato wart and uh, disease and the fact that that has actually closed the American uh, market uh, to PEI potatoes. Although I've been hearing in the last week or so that that might, situation might change. What I'm trying to get at here is that because we are such a class-oriented, hierarchically organized society, even white Canadians uh, who have more status than Canadians of color, to speak frankly. That's the way we've organized our society. So I'm not saying anything that's outrageous here. Uh, they also get um, stratified uh, according to class and, and their employment categories. And if they happen to be involved in resource extraction, even oil and gas in Alberta, uh, they'll suffer uh, whenever there's any kind of contraction or impediment to their economic activities. Uh, but so to get to the point, things changed in, in Guy's world because finally there were activists and, and black organizations, not to mention the Human Rights Commission in Nova Scotia, uh, who were very interested, all very interested in trying to equalize opportunity 
uh, for black youth, especially uh, in Guysboro. And the only way, the best way to do that is to make sure that uh, high quality education is available right up to uh, high school. And eventually, um, when we mature enough as a society, colleges and universities will be free, taxpayer funded. And that's the very best way to ensure that we have a robust middle class is to have free access to post-secondary education. The idea that young people about to start their lives, maybe to start families and starting careers, have to start by owing banks hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars uh, is a disservice to the entire society because it means that, that, that they are beginning with a sense of anxiety and being behind the eight ball, so to speak, and, and uh, when they should be able to just focus on their studies, get into their careers, and begin to contribute to the society and to the economy without basically becoming indentured to the banks. Uh, so, and something else that has to change for, for everybody. We're, we're um, concentrating on a fair bit of politics tonight. I don't know, I don't know if you were expecting that at, at uh, an author event, um, but this is a very good question over here. I'm really appreciating what is being shared here and the context being provided. Could Mr. Clark speak to Bill 21 in Quebec and one, how it both goes against the charter, but apparently can't be challenged and two, how it creates another layer of hierarchy class in this country. Oh, absolutely. And I thank you so much for that question. And, and I know, I'm sorry if I got into a little too much politics and so on, but I'll just say as I begin to answer the question that the reason why I do that is because I've come to understand as a writer and as a scholar, as a professor of English, uh, working with historical texts and political texts, the constitution, for one thing, that everything that we do is structured it's structured by, by the social political structures that we've given ourselves or that have been imposed upon us, depending on your, your point of view. Um, and that it's difficult to really understand any context without taking into account uh, the, the social political arrangements. So to come directly to Bill 21, this has to be set in the context of Quebec history, positive and negative. Um, I'll begin with the positive, which is that, of course, la survivance, the idea that the Quebecois de Souche, as they call themselves, uh, the, the descendants of the original 10,000 settlers of, of the uh, 17th century, uh, including les filles de bois, uh, the daughters of the king who are uh, brought over from basically Paris and, and, and asked to marry whoever met them at the, at the gangplank when they, when they disembarked for crying out loud. Uh, but in any event, uh, that's where modern Quebec history begins um, uh, with this idea that they are a, a special uh, group of European settlers uh, to Canada who no longer see themselves as being settlers. They see them, that's why they say Quebecois de Souche, Quebecers from the roots, right? Uh, there's no, necessarily any sense that, well, actually our roots are, are in La Rochelle uh, or in Nantes uh, or in uh, other parts of Brittany and Bretagne and, and Normandy and so on, uh, as well as Paris to a certain extent, but rather that, that they have, are magically indigenous themselves, which is one reason why it's difficult for indigenous people to have any serious uh, soul-searching conversations with Quebecois, uh, uh, the historical Quebecois population, because they see themselves as being indigenous and having just as many rights uh, as the as the francophone uh, stewards of the province of Quebec, which they do see as being their nation, uh, le pays, uh, the country, um, and and a nation in all but name, uh, politically speaking. And and that uh, and so therefore, uh, they have a they have a right to they see for themselves to structure their society as they wish. Uh, the society started off again. Uh, Quebec is also descended from a monarchy, the French monarchy, and there was no French Revolution in Canada. <laughs> there no 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 guillotines. There were gallows, but no guillotines. Uh, nobody got their head chopped off uh, in the name of liberté, égalité, fraternité. It didn't happen. So Quebec went through 200 years after the 
conquest of 1760 up to 1960, 200 years of essentially being a, a very uh, uh, Catholic-based uh, society and, and therefore relatively intolerant, relatively intolerant of other faiths, um, uh, people who are considered alien, uh, and it's important to know, and I am not demonizing Quebec here, by the way, just to say it. Uh, my daughter is Quebecoise. She was born in Quebec. Her mom is Quebecoise. So I have a lot of admiration and appreciation for the people of Quebec, like Quebecois, and what they have created for themselves. And in many ways, it's a very progressive uh, society. But there is an, an underside to that. And that's what I'm trying to sketch for you here, is that is that through those 200 years of essentially hunkering down in the faith, which again was protected by the Quebec Act in 1775, uh, and also the, the Code Civil, um, which is a, a, a separate Quebec legal code, which was also protected by the Quebec Act of 1775. Um, and and uh, of course, having uh, uh, essentially up until recently, uh, essentially a church-run school system uh, for Catholic Francophones. Um, uh, they developed a sense of, of themselves as being uh, fundamentally a Catholic European society uh, and, and uh, uh, French speaking, of course, and that that is really the identity of, of, the, of the majority. And that has to come first. That is what has to be protected. The Quiet Revolution did uh, secularize Quebec, secularized Quebec radically. All of a sudden went from, from being uh, more or less uh, rooted strongly in an idea of faith to being, to being essentially ultra-modern. And uh, Pierre Trudeau's career is actually a good sign of, of that transformation of, of Quebec, which he was actually part of. And, and championed, although, of course, he, he wanted to tamp down the nationalist side of things because he understood that nationalism can become intolerant of minorities. And, and another important part of Quebec history to recognize here is that when, when Canada had a Nazi party, when Canada had uh, outright fascists uh, between the 1920s and beginnings of the Second World War, their base, for the most part, was in Quebec. Uh, the leader of the of the Canadian Nazi Party uh, was Adrian Arcand, who was Quebecois, and he had his blue shirts, and uh, they had their swastikas, and they admired Hitler, and so on. But the roots of fascism in Quebec began with Mussolini, because Mussolini, being having his his agreement with the Catholic Church, was seen as as being a, a good leader and a good negotiator. Uh, of, of the strains between business and workers. And because Quebecers, Quebecois, did not want to go in a socialist direction or a communist direction, they thought it would be better to go in a fascist direction. Um, so they could have the church, still keep the church, but yet have economic progress. That was the, uh, that was the deal that they made. And a lot of, of leading Quebecois intellectuals bought that accepted that. In fact, there's a, still a church in Montreal to this day where you can see a fresco of Mussolini on a, on a white horse because he was seen as being a heroic guy. It's there. It's there. You can look it up. Google it. Uh, the Mussolini fresco in the church in Montreal. You, I haven't seen it myself, but I know it's there. You can see pictures of it online. But anyway, so Quebec always did have an authoritarian side, Duplessis. I just got a name Duplessis here as a good example of that, there, there was always a nationalist, conservative, authoritarian side, which is exactly what Pierre Trudeau was always fighting against when he became prime minister. I mean, he was also uh, a leading intellectual be behind his magazine, Cité Libre, always advocating for liberalism, 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 as a way to tamp down the nationalist orientation of Quebec. But again, I'm not demonizing Quebec because I'll also point out that when the Ku Klux Klan moved into Canada in the 1920s, they set up a uh, base camp in Saskatchewan. Uh, and and they, were an ex they were a very powerful group in Saskatchewan. In fact, the very progressive conservative Prime Minister John George Stephen Baker 
if I remember properly, I don't want to say anything that might be that might be false. I think I remember reading at one point that he himself was a member of the Klan when he was beginning his political career, knowing that that was the only way he was going to get any kind of traction uh, in rural Saskatchewan was by, you know, uh, basically acceding to to the Klan. Uh, so uh, Quebec is not alone with having sometimes some authoritarian or extremely uh, uh, regressive tendencies. But Bill 21, to finally come to it, um, is, in my mind, the latest expression, even though it's been put forward with, with, a ter with secularist notions of, well, we shouldn't recognize anybody's religious faith, it's a secular society. And they are following France, which put in similar legislation 10, 15 years ago. Um, and and uh, uh, the, the secularist uh, approach to things, but that we cannot forget, however, that the bill is still intolerant. No matter how much you want to dress it up with, oh, we're just trying to be secular. We're just trying to be secularist. It is still intolerant. It is still denying people their right under the Canadian Constitution, which does have preeminence in Quebec. It does. You know, I'm not. I shouldn't get into this, but look it. If Pierre Trudeau was prime minister, <laughs> I don't think I don't think there'd be a, still a blockade going on in Ottawa. I can tell you that, and I also don't think that that uh, Bill tw uh, Bill Twenty One would have gone without challenge, serious challenge in the courts, including the Supreme Court. Right away, they would have referred to the Supreme Court, and and instead of cringing in fear before the the before essentially right wing nationalists who are the current government in Quebec, uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau would have been front and center arguing for cosmopolitanism, multiculturalism, celebrating Montreal, the glories of Montreal as, as a great multicultural cosmopolitan city. As a matter of fact, what Bill 21 is, it's the attack of the hinterland on the city. Bill 21 is rural Quebec saying, Niet in a Putin style. A Putin style niet to Montreal. You got too many immigrants. You got too many people of color. You got too many Muslims, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's rural Quebec saying to Montreal, you're going the wrong way. You're losing the spirit of, of 1775. Right? Um, and I'm having some fun with that, but it's actually very serious because people are losing jobs and, and being demonized. Because the problem with putting forward that kind of legislation is that you suddenly say to the blatant racist, it's okay to discriminate. I remember to come right back home to Ontario. I'm sorry to have to say this, but but when uh, Doug Ford was elected, uh, some of us might remember that there were some folks, especially in rural Ontario, who took the view that it was now okay to openly express racist sentiments towards, I remember a TV news clip of a family wanting to ride the ferry here in Toronto, to one of the Toronto Islands and being accosted by a gentleman shortly after the election of Mr. Ford, who felt emboldened and empowered to tell them to go back where they came from in a very sneering and, and, and extremely aggressive uh, fashion. And, and members of that family responded by saying, we were born here which I think was a great surprise to, to that particular gentleman. So, and that's only because they somehow interpreted uh, Mr. Ford's election victory as being a signal or a sign for them to, to go and attack uh, uh, minorities. Uh, in a similar way in the United States, when Trump was elected, suddenly people felt that they had license to attack um, African-Americans, Latinos, uh, anybody who they felt was, was uh, disrupting uh, what they perceived uh, as being the whiteness of America. And I think a lot of that comes from the fear uh, that in the next uh, uh, 20 years or so, uh, whites, white Americans will cease to be the majority. Um, and that will be, that's a major demographic shift, uh, uh, which I, I think particularly the followers of Mr. Trump are trying somehow by using voting suppression, voter suppression, to <clears throat> deny the majority uh, the right to be represented by people, uh, some of whom may look a little bit more like them. Uh, so basically, uh, the voter suppression and other end runs around the Constitution 
including the attempt to steal the election just last year, are attempts to maintain essentially white supremacy. Um, whether or not uh, whites become a minority in the United States. But that's what's at stake. Uh, that's what's going on in, in my humble opinion. And similarly, I think with some of the folks uh, who are carrying Nazi flags and, and the stars and bars, who may actually be American, according to the Ottawa police chief, uh, wh whether they are or not, also represent that, that uh, fringe group who feel that their own social identity is endangered by the presence of uh, people of color, of religious minorities, um, and that this somehow makes Canada a less livable place for them if they happen to see a person of color enjoying a Tim Hortons uh, coffee, or they happen to see a person of color playing hockey. Uh, this is this is a problem, and and again, I I I know I've talked a lot, but I just I do sometimes have have a, a yearning for uh, Papa Trudeau, <laughs> as opposed to Baby Trudeau. I'm thinking of Papa Doc and Baby Doc. So, yeah, sometimes I, I think yeah, the old man might have might have handled things a little tiny bit better uh, than than the baby is doing. So I, although we have a lot of questions, I do want to get back to the book because uh, this is an author event. Um, for me, one of the most striking elements of your memoir is your poet voice that sings through the prose. I don't think I've ever read an, an, a memoir that was written in the style that you have written this one in. Um, and having heard you read at poetry events, um, the text, when I was reading the text, I heard your voice speaking aloud to me and you weren't an audio book. So I am wondering if you could kindly set the scene and share a reading with our guests. And I'm going to turn my mic and video off so that we can concentrate on your wonderful memoir. Oh, thank you so much, Risha. Uh, and I have enjoyed tonight and I hope that my comments have not distressed anyone. Um, I, I'm just sharing what I, what I think. Um, and and uh, I don't mean any any uh, disrespect to anybody. Um, so I hope that the historical and political stuff I, I've mentioned will just be taken in stride. And, and you can always do your own research and so on to see if there's anything to what I've been saying. But to get to this, and I'm so happy reading from the book. Uh, and one of the most uh, pleasant memories for me is of my parents putting on these parties in our living room. And that was a custom. I'm going to talk about that anyway, so I won't talk about it right now. And so I just, this passage is about those, those party moments. Um, so whatever their different tastes in music, my parents knew that when hosting friends and relatives for a party, only black music, funky, bluesy, earthy, guttural, sweet, salty, spicy would suffice. Indeed, the house party was an Africadian custom. Until the 1990s in Halifax, white-owned nightclubs often barred most black men using any pretext or were expensive, uh, though pouring watered-down iced-up drinks. And so, weekly, in the 1960s, select households would lay in a store of booze a stack of 45s, plus crackers, sardines, olives, potato chips, beer nuts, and invite a mix of singles and couples to come and waltz and sing and hum and shindig and hootenanny and grope and drink and smoke until somewhere around about 3 a.m. Whenever my parents hosted a gathering, my brothers and I would be dispatched to our bedrooms or allowed to watch television in our parents' bedroom, but we definitely had to be shut away from the adults apart from presenting perfunctory respectful greetings to any early arrivals. We had to disappear by 7 or 8 p.m., and then the party would start hopping assuredly by 9 p.m. Naturally, Bryant and Bill, my two brothers, and I would make up excuses to slip downstairs because the presence of all these black, brown, white adults, couples, singles, 
relatives was strange and exciting. When I go downstairs to the kitchen, I try to sneak a glimpse of those mysterious cackling goings on. I'd see that the living room was opaque, dense, black with multicolored people, a few pale girls in the mix. I always wondered when I beg a glass of milk for my tolerant, this time smiling parents, how did so many adults compress themselves into those compressing corners of the living room? And what possible pleasure could they gain from the physical pressure of having to dance, stand, sit, almost always tightly intertwined? Must have been the music, the songs that let the couples brush against each other, press against each other, melt into each other, to kiss lips, hair, eyelids, cheeks, laughter was guffaws, roars, Body or folks' voices receded to whispers. Cigarette smoke was an amoeba against the ceiling, and then slowly silvered, silted down, saturating every close clinging body and all the tight clinging clothes. Pumps would slide off so nylon or bare feet could shift and shuffle over the carpet. Men's brogues got untied or their loafers would get kicked off. Somehow anywhere between a dozen to two dozen adults could clinch and clutch and kiss and tighten up in our living room. The lights off and or the lamps covered over. The record players spinning the slow jams, the waltzes, so that the couples could really feel each other as female hips ground into male groins. These nights were when the serious music got played, the rhythm and blues that went well with rum and coke or rye and ginger. It was all blue light, black light, Millie Jackson and James Brown and peaches and herb, nor were the drinks skimpy, i.e. half water with ice bulking up the content to dull the ache of absent alcohol. Sometimes I'd wonder if my father regretted not playing his Beethoven on such nights. But he knew, as did my mom, that the folks were assembling to hear their music, black music, the music of real love, physical love, and orgasmic satisfaction saturating every corpuscle and follicle and nerve end and brain cell. The artistry of European classicists, could it compete with the moans and cries and hollers and howls born out of plush-lipped Negro mouths and the guttural depths of the tuneful soul and properly tuned heart. Could it make you want to love and be loved, to get down and get happy? In my dad's 1959 diary, he recounts an incident wherein he invited a black couple to audit his preferred music, either classical or crooners, and he became irked when they poo-pooed it. So irritated was he, he bade him leave his premises. But he was influenced by my mom and he got over that kind of attitude. If a guy got too plastered at one of my parents' parties, he'd stay overnight snoring on the sofa or the living room floor until he became elastic enough to move on. As a boy, it was always disconcerting or disgusting for me to get up from bed and go downstairs into those morning after situations. And, and when, where I would see cigarette butts, butts floating with olive pits in one rum and coke tumbler or some almost emptied glass of ale, there'd be the stink of stale beer the revolting tang of cigarette smoke saturated clothes. But it was also exciting to experience the aftershock of explicitly non-Baptist activities. Baptists aren't supposed to dance. Uh, and then dressed up, troop off to Sunday school. By the time the regular church service began at 11 a.m., even the hardest partying sat night adult would, would show suave and spiffy. Assuredly, God was awfully tolerant of black Baptist sinners. Yes, God was awfully tolerant of black Baptist sinners, I think. 
At a Bay Road house party that my parents hosted in 63, I forged a happy memory of black platters, of sable vinyl music overturning uh, of mores. Limbo Rock 1962 by Chubby Checker was the rage. And I got to witness my parents, their adult siblings and black and white friends, women, shimmy down as low as they could to bring their chest level with their shins, their ankles, and pass under a yardstick my father's humble handyman instrument handheld low or supported by two stools. I just remember the looks of sheer gaiety on those faces, dark, lovely, pale, lustrous, as the skirts and dresses got hiked, shoes bounced off, and folks got down. 7 p.m. was bitty by time for the kitties, so I didn't long witness the gymnastic shenanigans, but I was impressed by the hoopla, the whoopee the cha-cha-cha of those integrated Nova Scotian slinking, yo-yo-ing, their haunches to Carib, backbeat, Afro, and r and B. Oh, how I long to be in that number. There was salvation level ecstasy in such fiestas and a sense that this was a heaven that only Negroes could enter. That was magical. Thank you very, very much. So, Where Beauty Survived, an Africadian memoir, written as only could be written and spoken by George Eliot Clark. Thank you. And as our evening comes to a close, I'd like to thank George Eliot Clark for sharing his fabulous memoir with us, Lucy Pichette for tech support, and most especially our guests for celebrating Black History Month. Good night and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Happy Year of the Tiger.